Continue with our online service. All right, blessings to all of you. So good to be able to share this time together with all of you. And if you're joining us for the first time, I'm Pastor Terry, lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco. You know, our series is called Explore God. We're sitting with the big questions. We talked about a few weeks back, does life have a purpose? Last week we explored, is there even a God? Today we're gonna to be sitting with a profound question. Why does a good God allow for injustice and suffering? Like why do people suffer? How do we understand that? We're gonna actually have that question answered, that subject addressed by someone who's part of our Cornerstone teaching team, someone who's actually uniquely, I think, qualified, or at least more than capable of addressing it from a perspective of deep authenticity. I'm talking about Alice Costanzo, and she, as some of you know, is, in addition to being an excellent teacher of the scriptures, is legally blind. She can't, she can't see with her eyes. And also she's a cancer survivor. She knows suffering and she knows disability. And yet there's something remarkable about the way in which she shares with us the things of God. And so I'm deeply looking forward to hearing her perspective and how she wants us to understand what the scriptures have to teach us about suffering and how come God is still good even within the framework of our brokenness. But before we hear from her, I do want to remind everybody it's something I get to do. Remember our giving time. I'm talking about our tithes and our offerings, especially those of you who feel called to Cornerstone as your church home. When we sense a sense of connectedness, giving becomes an expression not only of worship, but also of our, of our idea of being part of something bigger than ourselves. So I really want to encourage you to honor the Lord with your first fruits, honor the Lord with your generosity. Remember when it comes to your tithes and offerings, you can send them in to our offices. You can give directly online, or you can give through our app, which is what I do. But like I always say, let's first give him our heart. So with all of that in mind, Lord Jesus, I just ask for your blessing on what we're about to share, not only in what we are giving, but in what we are about to receive. In your name I pray, amen. Pain, pain's a part of life. I think some people believe it's a test of your faith, but if you don't have a faith to believe in, it kind of makes you wonder why why is there suffering in this world? It was a reason why he took him. Uh, maybe he needed some angels up there to protect, protect, to help him in the fight against the devil. A baby is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Why doesn't he want me to have this? Bad things are just the way that you see them. I think God's in everything we do. Why would anybody want to create people who do horrible things to each other? It doesn't make any sense. I don't think God's sitting there and 
saying these people are hurting and maybe I should help them. I suppose the answers will come. It's just I'm going through a journey right now that's painful. Hello, Cornerstone. What a wonderful series we're in right now. I love that we get to ask all the hard questions about God and faith. And today's question, why does God allow pain and suffering, has got to be one of the toughest ones to answer. It's the question humankind has been asking for millennia. So I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to be able to address it sufficiently in just 30 minutes. We could probably do a whole series on this question alone. So I just wanna say up front, that I don't have all the answers, but I do hope that my message is food for thought. And I'm truly honored and humbled to get to share my personal perspective with you today. Some of you may have heard my story before, but I'll start with a little background. I was born legally blind with a retina disease. I lost my sight slowly over time and I'm completely blind today. I can't detect any light or any motion. And life without sight has been quite an adventure, to say the least. But believe it or not, there are some pretty good perks. For example, I have a great excuse to get out of the undesirable chores around the house, like cleaning the toilets and taking out the trash. I get to board first when I fly on an airplane, so there's always space for my carry-on. That's kind of nice. But I really adore my handicapped parking tag. It's a game changer in the city, city like San Francisco, and my friends totally love it too. They're always asking me to go shopping. Of course, there are some obvious cons to being blind. I don't have a lot of independence. I always need a ride, and I always need assistance when I'm out. I don't have a seeing eye dog, at least not yet. I have a seeing eye husband named Michael, and lucky for me, a couple of personal Uber drivers, AKA my kids, but all joking aside, it was very difficult for me to lose my vision. I was in denial for many, many years. And even when I could only see just a few feet in front of me, I refused to carry my white cane in public, which was a disaster waiting to happen. One day, I was shopping at The Gap, and there was a denim jacket hanging on a mannequin, and I was checking out the buttons and kind of moving up toward the collar, thinking, this is a pretty cool jacket. And then the mannequin said, hello. It wasn't a mannequin. It was a man waiting for his wife who was in the fitting room. I was so embarrassed, so embarrassed. And that was the day that I finally accepted the fact that I was going blind. Michael and I, we call it the gap incident. Raising three boys without sight has been very challenging. It's hard enough to keep boys alive, even if you can see, right? And taking care of my family got even harder when I was diagnosed with cancer in 2010. After a year of treatment, they gave me a 95% chance of being cured, pretty good odds. But eventually the cancer came back. It was now stage four. And this time the doctors weren't as optimistic and they told me not to make any long-term plans. I won't go into the gory details, but five years of experimental treatment later, somehow, miraculously, and my oncologist actually uses that word, miraculous, I'm still here. Thank you, Lord. Very, very grateful to be alive. But I remember the reaction of friends and family. Why does a blind girl get cancer? Not once, but twice. Why is life so unfair? There's a book in the Bible that addresses this very question that we're going to look at today, the book of Job. Scholars say that it's the oldest book in the Bible at around 1500 BC, which is ironic because the book's theme is still so relevant today. There are 42 chapters divided into three sections, a prologue, the main story, and then a conclusion. And in the interest of time, I'm going to highlight the key parts and summarize the rest. Now, the prologue sets up the story. And the interesting thing is that Job, the main character, has no idea about the setup. God is holding court with his angels and Satan, the angel that rebelled against God, shows up. And God begins to brag about Job. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan 
whose name means the adversary, argues that the only reason why Job worships God is because God has given him wealth and prosperity. Job has seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and countless servants. He's called the greatest man in all the East. Job isn't just a nice guy, he's a richy rich. He's like a cross between Mr. Rogers and a billionaire. And Satan insists, take away his blessings and he will surely curse you to your face. And God takes him up on it. He says, go ahead, do whatever you want, but you can't lay a finger on Job himself. And Satan says, you got a deal. Now, can you imagine if this were a Netflix reality show? What a hook. <laughs> Tune in to see if Job will curse his God. You could call it to curse or not to curse, or simply the wager. And the first episode would start showing the unsuspecting Job swaddled in wealth and happiness, and then the destruction would begin because Satan uses enemy tribes and natural disasters to kill all his children and servants and to destroy all his property and livestock. And the episode would end on this cliffhanger. How will Job react? Will he curse God or will he stay faithful? He fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Can you imagine God and Satan watching and God looking over at Satan and he's like, yeah, that's my man. That's my man, Job. But now Satan is very angry and he doubles down. He asserts that if Job's health were attacked, he would surely break. And God again allows it under the condition that he just can't take Job's life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it. As he sat among the ashes, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Now, I'm not sure why Job's wife is spared, but I'm glad she's in this story because many of us can relate to her perspective. What kind of a God lets the innocent suffer? And why would you want to follow a God like that? And this is such a natural reaction to the kind of suffering that doesn't make sense to us. Tough consequences from making some poor choices is one thing, but other painful seasons in our lives come completely out of the blue, and they seem so unfair, so unwarranted, and we're blindsided by them. I lost my mom to Alzheimer's. And I really had a hard time accepting her diagnosis. My parents were such dedicated Christ followers, always serving the church and everyone around them. And their dream was to go on medical missions after my dad retired. And I just couldn't understand why God would repay their faithfulness with such a terrible disease. Maybe you've experienced this kind of curveball in life also, the surprise layoff the divorce papers you didn't want, the devastating loss of a loved one. And for many of us, the suffering of innocent people in general can be a huge barrier to acknowledging that God is even real. Well, Job has lost everything and now he is in physical pain, but he still refuses to give up on God, but he's human. So he's beginning to wonder why this is all happening to him. And for the next 35 chapters, Job ruminates about his situation. Some of his friends show up and they mean well, but they have a very specific point of view. They believe that God rules the universe on the principle of justice at all times. So they're convinced that Job has sinned and that his demise is his punishment. They urge him to repent, but Job maintains his innocence. And he begins to ask more urgently, why me, Lord? Why me? He can't reconcile God's justice and goodness with the suffering he's experiencing. And he's getting more and more discouraged. And he cries out things like, why have you made me your target? And accuses God, maybe you're not good or just after all. Maybe you're just a big giant bully. Then suddenly, God arrives in the form of a cyclone. 
Now this would be another great place to end the Netflix episode. And of course now we're totally binge watching because we can't wait for poor Job to finally get his answer because God's gonna finally do the big reveal, tell him all about the wager, pat him on the back and say, great job, buddy. We showed that devil, we won the bet. There's hope for the human race after all, no hard feelings, right? Wrong. Instead of answering Job's question of why, God kind of explodes at Job with questions of his own. He booms, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. And as he continues to question Job in this rhetorical and sarcastic way, he takes Job on kind of a virtual tour of the beauty and complexity of creation in quite a bit of detail. God goes on and on and on and on about the stars and the ocean and the skies and the mountains and launches into the habits of the different animals he created, including the feeding pattern of lions and how storks take care of their young. And then at one point, he challenges Job to try to run the universe with his limited human knowledge. And he kind of puts Job in his place. I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically tells Job, I'm God, you're not. You need to trust me, what say you? Job is overcome with fear and reverence and he's like, okay, 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 I'll take it all back. And he humbly responds, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Then God tells Job that he's pleased with him, but makes a point to say that he is angry with his friends. We'll talk more about this later. Job gives a sacrifice on their behalf and God forgives them also. And then finally, God tells Job about his little bet with Satan, right? No. The conclusion simply states that God blesses him even more than before. He restores Job's health, replaces all of his children, and he doubles his previous wealth, and Job lives happily ever after the end. Okay, what is God trying to show us through Job's story? Here's the first thing that jumps out at me. God keeps his purposes hidden from us at times. We won't always know the answer to why does God fill in the blank? When my kids were little, they used to ask me all the time, why did God make you blind? And my answer was always, I don't know guys, he just did, he just did. Job never got his answer to why is this happening to me? And God's explosive interaction with him wasn't tender or soothing, but in kind of a terrifying way, I think that it was still reassuring. He may have hidden his purposes from Job, but he didn't hide himself. And God chose to reveal his power and authority because maybe that's what Job needed to experience most. And remember how he was spewing so much detail about the creatures he created? It's like he was saying, if I've got my eye on minutia, like where the stork buries her eggs, I've got my eye on you, Job. You're not going to fall through the cracks. I know exactly what I'm doing, trust me. I got you and I got this universe. And I'm so glad that the book of Job includes the prologue because it gives us a peek into the spiritual realm and shows us that there's an epic battle between good and evil going on and we are not the only characters in the story. There's this great line in the movie, The Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Maybe you remember that one. But the devil does exist, and his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's also called the accuser, and we certainly saw him in action as he accuses Job of a fair-weather faith. I think that God allowed Job to suffer because something greater than his comfort and happiness was at stake. Maybe Job's response had some kind of cosmic significance, or maybe God just wanted to teach Satan a lesson. We don't really know why. And even if we did, maybe we wouldn't understand. The prophet Isaiah says that our thoughts and ways are not like God's thoughts and ways. We're kind of on a need to know basis. But did you notice 
that Satan always had to ask permission before he could do anything to Job. And we see this in other parts of the Bible, like in Luke, when Satan asks God to have his way with Peter. And this little detail makes all the difference to me. It assures us that God is always in charge. Now, I'm not suggesting that each time our faith is tested, God is making another bet with Satan. But what I am saying is that even when his purposes elude us, God invites us to trust him because he is always in control. He is always in control. Now, I know it might not feel like he is because, unfortunately, as long as Satan and sin are in the picture, pain and suffering will be also. We are broken human beings living in a broken world. We hurt each other even when we try not to. I learned recently that 50 million people are trapped in modern slavery today. That's three times more than during the transatlantic slave trade. Job's story is a thorny reminder that life on earth is unfair and that the innocent will suffer. But even though life is unfair, God is not. God is not. Don't get the two things confused. Life is not God, and God is not just our life on earth. And God does care about what's going on down here, guys, so much so that he actually showed up in person. In many ways, the book of Job foreshadows someone else whose name starts with a J. Job was blameless, and yet God allowed him to suffer. Does that sound familiar at all? Jesus, God's own perfect son, was also blameless, and yet he was willing to die for us. What I love about our Lord is that he is not a hypocrite. He doesn't have a double standard. He didn't exempt himself from pain and suffering. He was willing to lose everything for us. He was betrayed, abandoned, tortured, and died an agonizing death, utterly alone. Jesus wins the unfairness contest, hands down, hands down. And if there's anyone who understands how we feel in the midst of pain and suffering, it's Jesus. Listen to what the author Philip Yancey says in his book, Disappointment with God. I really like this. The cross demolished for all time the basic assumption that life will be fair. The cross of Christ may have overcome evil, but it did not overcome unfairness. For that, Easter is required. Someday, God will restore all physical reality to its proper place under his reign. Until then, it is a good thing to remember that we live out our days on Easter Saturday. He's saying that we're kind of in this holding pattern. God already rescued us through Jesus, and Jesus rose from the grave on Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago, but there's another Easter Sunday coming when the rest of us will be resurrected to be with God forever, and Satan will finally be destroyed once and for all. But until then, we're kind of suspended in this phase that permits suffering and requires faith. The Lord is letting the story of the human race play out, and we can trust his perfect timing. God could absolutely eliminate all suffering and injustice in a split second if he wanted to. But I think he refrains because he leaves room for faith. So here's my next idea. God gives us the freedom to choose him. God's bet with Satan over Job on the one hand seems cruel, but on the other hand, it reveals something pretty profound about God's character. He doesn't force us to choose him. He doesn't force us to choose him. In fact, he loves us so much that he gives us the freedom not to choose him. One Mother's Day, Michael was out of town and my kids surprised me with breakfast in bed. It was totally their idea. My older ones were probably just 10 or seven at the time. And honestly, the food didn't taste all that great. The eggs were a little crunchy from the eggshells, but it was the most delicious meal I ever had because they chose to show me their love all on their own. No one forced them, no one bribed them. And God is the same way. He wants us to freely choose him. If he gave us everything we wanted, how will we know if we truly loved him? for who he is and not what he gives us. 
He wants us to come to him on our own volition. He wants a relationship with us. And following God is not like following a formula. Remember how God was upset with Job's friends? Why was that? They were trying to be helpful, and they believed in God also. But I think they kind of put God in a box. Their understanding of him was too shallow. If you sin, he'll punish you. If you don't, he'll bless you. And maybe they weren't interested in knowing God beyond this very simplistic equation. Faith is not a plug and play kind of thing. It's not a contract you negotiate about your living conditions on earth. It's a daily journey with God through the good days and the bad days. It's an adventure full of twists and turns. And like Job, the Lord invites us to even wrestle with him in the midst of our struggles. I think sometimes we set ourselves up for disappointment. We conjure up in our minds what we think God should be like. We don't make the effort to truly know him. And then when life doesn't go the way we expect, we accuse him of not being good. But Job's story shows us that God can handle our accusations. He will meet us wherever we are. God says, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And maybe that was the difference between Job and his friends. Job might have called God a bully, but he was truly seeking God in the midst of his pain while his friends were just following a formula. I like how the message version puts this verse. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. And that's when the breakthrough happens, right? When we get a fresh revelation of who God is like Job did, the why questions can melt away. Now I wanna be super clear about something. When God says that he won't disappoint us, he's not promising a comfortable life. In fact, Jesus said that we would have many troubles in this world, but God is the expert at using bad things for good. He used the pain of the cross to save us. You could argue that he used Job's suffering to make his faith even stronger. The good news, guys, is that adversity grows us. The bad news <laughs> is that adversity grows us. Which brings me to my next idea. God cares more about our character than our comfort. Character over comfort. Like a good father who doesn't coddle his children, he allows pain and suffering because sometimes it's good for us. No pain, no gain, right? James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Mature and complete. He's talking about transforming us into Christ's character. And my old job, they used to call me the shredder. <laughs> True story, I know it's hard to believe since I'm just a harmless little old blind lady now, but people actually used to fear me. <laughs> I shouldn't be proud of that because it wasn't a good thing. I was um, impatient, critical, demanding, and God used all the hard stuff in my life to make me a little kinder, a little gentler, and a lot more empathetic to others. And I don't ask why God would allow my mom to have Alzheimer's anymore because my dad cheerfully took care of my mom, feeding, bathing, dressing her for 12 long years. And when people asked him how he could be so joyful despite his wife's condition, his answer was simply Jesus. God had called my dad to medical missions after all. It just wasn't in the package that we were expecting. You know, some of us might say, I can't believe in God when the world is so unfair. But where do we think we got the notion of fairness from in the first place? We got it from the Lord. He put it in our hearts along with eternity, and we yearn for a place with no pain and suffering because that's what we were created for. Paul reminds us that our broken world is not our final destination. He calls our suffering light and momentary troubles compared to the eternal glory that is waiting for us. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 
As a blind person with FOMO, this verse really <laughs> speaks to me. It makes me feel like I'm not missing out that much on this seen-sighted, seen-sighted side of heaven. And as a cancer patient, I cling to this verse because it assures me that something way better is coming. I always hold my breath when I get the results of my routine PET scans. I get them like every six months or so. But cancer or not, guys, it's just a matter of time until my health will fail. And what's the true definition of being healthy anyway? I think that it's more important to be spiritual, spiritually and emotionally healthy. And you know how I define that? Knowing the Lord, and as a result, not being afraid. Not being afraid to suffer, and not being afraid to die. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't like pain. I've been through enough of it to last me a lifetime. I think I've had like 100 chemo treatments over the years. But pain isn't the worst thing in the world. Separation from God is. And I think that's why we're stuck on Easter Saturday a while longer. God wants us to spend eternity with him, and he's giving us more time to choose him, more time to help others choose him. I have this little saying, it's going to be okay, but if it's not okay, it's still okay. It's going to be okay, but it's, if it's not okay, it's still okay, because the best is yet to come. The final Easter Sunday is coming, guys. We will be with Jesus face to face. All the wrongs will be made right. We'll be with our loved ones again. I'll get to actually see again, maybe even take a Ferrari for a spin. Pain and suffering will be no more. I can't wait. I can't wait. But what do we do in the meantime, especially if we're in a season of suffering? We can follow Job's example and respond with faith. And what does faith look like? As I close, I have just a couple of practical things for you. And the first one is, don't get stuck in the why. Don't get stuck in the why. Remember how the more Job asked why, the more discouraged he became? I think God arrived at just the right moment. He turns the tables and asks Job the questions. He effectively repositions Job away from his questions and sets him up to respond. And that's when Job gets unstuck. He stops searching for a reason and he chooses faith. It's okay to ask God the why questions, but don't get stuck there. If we get stuck there, we just get bitter. Instead of why, let's ask a different question. What can we learn from this? How can we help others through this? Where is God leading me with this? Let's not get stuck. And here's the last thing I'll share. Practice spiritual CPR. Spiritual CPR. You guys know the medical CPR, right? I have a spiritual version that has helped me so much over the years. Cling, pray, remember. See us for cling, cling to God's promises, hang on to his word, let it anchor us daily. Our Lord will never leave or forsake us and there's so many beautiful promises for us to hang on to. P is for pray, we talk to him daily, we bring our requests to him, we leave our anxieties at his feet, and when we say, not my will, but yours, Lord, he promises to strengthen us and give us peace. And the letter R, remember. Remember how he brought us through past trials. Remember our blessings. Remember that Jesus already defeated sin and we're, that we're just in this temporary holding pattern. Remember that it's all going to be okay, even if it doesn't seem like it or feel like it, even when nothing makes sense. We can still trust in our all-powerful, loving, just, always in control God. Let's pray. Father, we admit that sometimes we look around and life, life just seems so unfair, but we know that you are not an unfair God. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who defeated death, your son who understands firsthand the unfairness of this broken world. Give us your strength and comfort. We trust in your perfect timing, your perfect wisdom, and your perfect love. In your son's precious name, we pray. Amen. Blessings, everyone. Lost 
everything is lost and everything I've loved before is gone alone like the coming of the frost in a cold winter's chill in my stony heart and where Oh, Lord, when it comes to pain and suffering and sometimes the injustice or the unfairness of life, the hurt of life, it's easy to, it's easy to close down our heart and be defined by those wounds, but you give us an example. I mean, you give us you. You know what it's like to suffer. You know what it's like to be wounded. You know what it's like to be in pain and you didn't have to do it. You did it for us. So not only did you give us an example, but you give us a presence that is worth more than any money we could ever have in this world. And so Lord, I'm just so thankful for what you've done for us. I'm so thankful that you entered into suffering and that your answer ultimately to the human question of why is your hands stretched out wide? We're so loved. 
We thank you for the cross. Help us to keep it always near. We love you, Jesus. We ask for your blessing as we move forward in life, unafraid, full of courage, trusting you for our tomorrows. In Jesus' name.